Welcome to the Wisdom Check by Tabletop to Keyboard. This is going to be our bi-weekly podcast where we discuss things such as Dungeons and Dragons. Actually, I think maybe we need to turn up my mic a little bit, guys. How about some more game? More game. This the intro to end all intros. Talk about Dungeons, Dragons, and Dungeons. Now, now, I don't think that's proper. This is a family show, after all. This is the intro we can use, fellas. It's good, clean fun for everyone. Welcome to the Wisdom Check, where we have wholesome conversations about the dilemmas we face every day. Nah, 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 hold on a second. I got your intro right here. Yeah, that's better. Welcome to the Wisdom Check. Well, I'm right, just wrong. We're going to have guests on to talk about it. It's going to be awesome, because I said so. He is right. He did say so. I don't know. Is surf music the best music for a podcast about D&D? Fuck yeah. Okay. This just in, nobody can agree on our intro for this podcast, so we're just going to start. Welcome to the Wisdom Check. Roll for initiative. Fuck. A one. It's like every time. Got us brought in live. All right, and here we are. We should be up and live. Fingers crossed. It's looking good, yes. I think. I think it worked. I think, by God, we got it. Woo! All right, so thank you, everybody. Welcome to the Wisdom Check. I'm Dustin. Over there with me is Jeff, miraculously today, because Clint's not here to make this thing work. So some last-minute coaching from him, and I think I got this thing set up right. And I even managed to get our guest in here with us today, too. This is Bob. If you might recognize Bob, if you're a fan of watching Dad Bod d and on Twitch, you'll find him every Friday running a Waterdeep game, and we're going to talk a little bit about that up here first. Uh, so Bob, why don't you tell us a little bit of how you, how you got started in tabletop role-playing games? Sure, yeah, so about four years ago, a buddy of mine wanted to, you know, start a game with people at work, and so, which is typically a terrible idea because, you know, we all work together, we, we know how that can end, but I did find, you know, one of my best friends playing this game. He was a rando from Looking for Group, mm-hmm. which was Devin. And so Devin has kind of transitioned this entire journey with me. And from there, that game fell apart, was out of it for about six months, and I got the itch really bad to come back. And I'm like, hey, let's see if we can get a group together. I'll take a snap <laughs> the Emmy and we'll do it on YouTube. So <laughs> those those can be those can be found somewhere my very first um, DM experience, and it was kind of a train wreck. Really? Why, why, would, why would you say that? Um, I, I had probably been in Dungeons & Dragons for about a year to a year and a half at that point, and mm-hmm. it was with two other YouTubers that were um, puppets. And while that's not a problem, because there's going to be a puppet in one of our one-shots coming up, these guys spent the entire time just trying to help every animal that there was and it's just like me I, I can't oh God. I can't yeah it was it was an, it was a nightmare and they've never played before but all of that has led me here to be a part of the dad bod d and um, you know kind of the community that we're trying to build so wow so, so you said puppet um, do you mean literally puppet like or is that a term I'm just not familiar with no they so they were off the camera and then they had a puppet that, oh my god Wow. <laughs> yeah. I'm not going to give him a shout out because that ain't happening. <laughs> now, was this something that was already pre planned or is this just something that just went off the rails? Because that sounds like a, a last minute surprise. I was. Ex- so, they have a YouTube channel that is solely them talking in their puppets. I was asking them if they could be their human selves here for a while, and they mm-hmm. chose to come as their puppet selves, which is like. <laughs> Well, let's see how this is going to work. I mean, it's going to be interesting. Wow. So it worked up until the animal stuff started happening, is what you're telling me. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, and then I, it, it was about five sessions, and I'm like, I'm out. I can't. I'm sorry. Wow. <laughs> That's amazing. Well, I guess we all have our stories, you know. Like at some point, things do go a little weird in gaming. And uh, usually at the beginning, when you're first getting into it, I mean, I can look back at our games in the, uh, the good old days of childhood. And I can blame it on the fact we're children, thankfully. But, boy, there were some bad elements in our games. <laughs> <laughs> That's for sure. Some very hauntingly embarrassing things in now, our games. I was messing with a few settings because they were mentioning some static uh, from one of the mics. I was trying to get that out of there. Did you say what system it was you started in on that one, Bob? Like, what's, what was your first role-playing game system you started in? Yeah, I started in 40, which um, mm -hmm. it, it was right at the time 5e came out. And I, I have to say, I am so glad we made the jump to 5e. Um, yeah. So for me as a person, I feel like 4e was very, very, like combat, you know, turn-based system, yeah. whereas 5e mm -hmm. is much more, you know, applicable to, like, the role-playing sessions that we at you know, Dead Bob do, oh. so... Um, yeah, we, we can scale it a little bit better. It, it's easier to bend some of the rules and stuff like that. Right. Yeah, I think that 5e is definitely more flexible in, in terms of rules. Now, now, are you talking about role-playing in the sense of, uh, like, during combat, you know, being able to have more options, or are you talking about you feel like the system itself actually prevented you from playing characters? Um, well, yes and yes and no to both of those, right? So mm -hmm. I feel like 5e, it, it just really allows, and, you know, maybe it might be my inexperience with 4e, but I, I feel like you're not hindered by the mechanics of the game in 5e, whereas mm -hmm. 4e was just rules top to bottom and, you know, everything had a mechanic and it was so strict and it was so by the book, you, yes, you could change it. You could make mm -hmm. those, you know, small homebrew changes to the rules, but I feel like 5e is just built to do that. Oh, sure. Yeah. I mean, 5e is definitely more modular. You know, it's definitely a, you know, kit in whatever you want into the system and yeah. drop anything you don't want in there. Yeah. So I would definitely agree with that. Just doing yeah. a little throwback to our earlier conversations a couple episodes ago about 4e. Yeah, yeah, we had DM Chuck on here talking about it pretty extensively. Um, they do a lot of 4E over there, so... But, um... What is, is he pro 4E? Oh, yeah, he's very pro 4E. He's actually starting another 4E game soon that I'm going to be in, so... It's going to be a lot of fun. Actually, That'll come up in another month or so. Myself, but for different reasons, you know? Like, yeah. I, I think in terms of uh, system clarity and in terms of combat, I think it had the most interesting... Uh, I'll tell you what's been interesting on these Wisdom Chick shows is how many people we've had that got started in 4E. Like, you didn't that think... That is actually you, shocking. You don't think about 4th Ed as a game that brought a lot of people into D&D. Like, I feel mm -hmm. like it tried to reach out to, like, the WoW MMO community, because that's why I've always said it felt like playing it. It felt like doing, like, a WoW dungeon in D&D. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, with the healers, the tank rolls, like, all that being so specified. But it's interesting how many people got started into that. So were you an MMO gamer who got into D&D, 4th Ed from that kind of transition? Because I know you play some MMOs. So I am an MMO gamer. So I, you know, I do have some street cred. Uh, I started <laughs> with the uh, Ultima Online back in the day when it was oh, yeah, that's a, early 90s. Wait, right? That's old school. Uh, me, me and my brother, so me, you know, Chris from Dead Bond, him and I played Ultima Online for hours, you know, on our old dial-up. But I did not come to 4E from anything like that. So the guy I worked with, he was a DM through 3.5. He was just transitioning to 4E. And that's when he said, hey, let's try this system out. Let's see what you guys think. Because he took a long time to make the jump from 3.5 to 4, because mm -hmm. 3.5 is probably the, has the mo most wealth of knowledge and, you know, rule books and just modules and, you know, source material to go with it. And he's like, well, we can do for you. I'll start a new game. We'll start this new system. We'll all learn it together. Mm -hmm. And so that's what got me into it, not the, you know, the call from the MMOs. <laughs> oh, gotcha. Yeah, I mean, I, I do think that there is a, uh, a tendency to grab for the audience that exists at the time. So I think the companies were definitely kind of uh, catering a little bit to the biggest explosion of things in uh, gaming at that time, which was World of Warcraft. But yeah, clearly it's just... People come into game systems when they come into it. Um, I would say, you know, like first, a lot of people, it's when they go to college. I think is when they first <laughs> run into gaming, right? 
you know, at least in tabletop, that's when you start to get nerds that somehow end up in the same proximity to one another and somehow sniff each other out. Co- college is the first place where you can you can form a club mm-hmm. where you can get together and do some of those things and have a space where you can go do it, and you're probably not harassed by people. Like, at least in those days. Like, it's probably anyone can do them now, but not maybe not back yeah. then. I, I would say that one, one thing that, that is nice, so both two guys that I play games with are teachers and they do harbor the, for high schools. So they do harbor these clubs in the safe place for people to just come and play. So whether they're playing D and D or some other tabletop game, you know, before class, they'll come in there and they'll just play and hang out. And it's this nice spot for people to just learn and play together. Whereas back when I was in high school, that that wasn't, yeah, there was no places like that hit around to go to for sure. We're talking about satanic panic days. We didn't have uh, support from the community. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's it's a mind blowing thing that the game has come around that far from literally, you know, documentaries and PSAs coming out saying the kids should stay away from gaming to, you know, pop television and stars and everything coming out of the woodwork to uh, play it. And uh, I mean, the popularity is just just crazy to me. Like, yeah, I would have never expected it as a kid. And, and Fifth Ed, I think, has a lot to do with that. Just how inviting yeah. Fifth Ed is and how, I guess to someone who really liked 3.5, Fifth Ed probably feels like it has the training wheels on. But it allows yeah. so many people to get into into the game that would have never, I don't think they would have ever enjoyed Fifth Ed or 3.5 right out the bat. Like, I would agree. And... It was funny, we talked about this on our podcast, which is our um, variety hour, whatever you want to call it. Um, it, it, you know, it, it really is the emergence of some of these bigger name actors that are, you know, Joe Mank, maybe, you know, I can never say his name. It's, it's a hard um, one. <laughs> and then Colbert playing his, you know, D&D duet with, um, with Matt Mercer, you know, you have Matthew Lillard, who is, you know, mm-hmm. all of these, all of these guys are so big and they're so, bringing so much, you know, love to the D and D community that it's exploding right now. Yeah, and when did you uh, decide to join those people, like in the the online world of streaming and making videos and stuff? Um. So. I started before I started doing this YouTube thing before um, uh, before I started playing D and D. So I was doing you know how tos and let's plays with just various games, and that's when it kind of it stopped. It didn't really go anywhere, and then I'm like, hey, let's play D and D together online, and that's that's what got me into it because I already had this base kind of set up. Nice. Yeah, it's, it's it's a beautiful thing getting out here and being, being able to share your game, share the experiences that you're having at the table, you know, like the, the just the joy of gaming, I would say. Like, it's been a big transition for us, I think, you know, trying to deal with the, the, the difference of having an audience, you know, and kind of performing, but not totally performing, you know, and actually just kind of sitting back and relaxing a little bit. And, um, uh, I don't know, maybe that's just me, because I, I really pay attention to it a lot, but uh, what about you? Did you guys feel a big shock of difference when we made the jump? Um, no, I mean, it wasn't too bad. I think I think we mainly just come to play, and we come to just hang out and have fun, and if there's people there, there's people there. It's not. It's fun. You know, mm-hmm. it is what it is. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, now, you were talking about celebrities getting into gaming and doing these streams and stuff, and uh, well, we've got a bit of an announcement to make, and I don't want to jinx this. I'm a, I'm, I'm a little nervous about it, but... Uh, you're, you're going into that already, man? I thought we'd say that till the end of the show. You want to save it? You want to yeah. tease it now and then save it till the end? I mean, the nail to you, happen. but... Yeah, okay, we'll wait. We'll make them wait a little bit. Yeah, that's, that's a good call. We'll, we'll build the tension. Just make it slowly rise throughout the thing. So I guess at that point, since we're going to delay gratification on uh, on our announcement, uh, maybe we should get into our first topic. So our first to topic so. tonight is going to be talking about modules, and in particular, 
one of the complaints a lot of people in our gaming group have is that when you do modules, it seems that it's hard to get role playing in. You're in the wrong topic, Jeff. We're starting with one shots. We're starting with one, one shots, shots, Jeff. One shots. How about I completely missed the mark? <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Okay. Well, then let's switch topics so Shadzar doesn't have to worry about it too much. So um, yeah. So one shots. Preparing one shots. That's what we're talking about. <laughs> well, one of the reasons uh, we wanted to bring this up was to give Bob a chance to talk a little bit about what he's doing on his channel with his one shots at the moment. So why don't you go ahead and give yourself a good old nice plug there, Bob, and then we'll talk about ways to make one shots cool and fun. Sure. Um, so, all right. So with Dad by D&D, we want to be more than just people who stream for you. We want it to be a part of the community. We want you to be a part of our community. And what there is missing today in, you know, some, I, I feel like some, um, you know, like roll 20 does it, Reddit does it. So there's some people that have these add ons that are looking for group. Mm -hmm. Um, but there's, there's not really a good way to like vet or test or make sure you're a good fit into that group. So a lot of people, you're already into session zero by the time you get to figure out how this group works together. And if you're already into session zero, you've already devoted time and effort into making a character and mm -hmm. making all the backstory, making the world, if you're the DM, doing all of this prep, just to find out this party is not, you know, cohesive to, to work together. So what we're doing, we have community one-shots. So they can be hosted on our channel. They could just be whenever you want. Um, I think mm -hmm. DM Chuck from Defenders of Kobolds, I think if that's right. Yep, I think that's right. Um, he's actually promoting his own one shot to get people from our community to join his one shot on his channel. So in our discord, we have community one shots set up for people to come in. If you're looking for a group, if you want to just play, they're there. It's, it's sign up at will. Um, we do try and make it so that if you signed up for all of them, please don't do that. Um, <laughs> you know, give, give people who haven't had the chance to do it, uh, uh, you know, the opportunity to join, but we mm -hmm. do, we have been posting a ton of one shots for people to join. It's one every other week, roughly. Wow. Um, so yeah, it, it's 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 a lot of work, but mm -hmm. I think it's the payoff is that the community gets the chance to find somebody or something to latch onto to play with and make it um, their own thing. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. That's because I mean that's something we don't typically do on our side of things. We spend a lot of time with the same group of players because we all group together playing together. And, well, we're, we're kind of hermits, um, <laughs> believe it or not. Uh, but this this idea of adding new people to groups and building a community has uh, it's a lot of appeal. Like, I think that's probably the coolest thing about doing this show and setting up the Discord that we've set up is that it feels like we are getting this broader community kind of coming into it. And like you said, like one-shots are a fantastic way to kind of vet players and get them used to one another. Uh, give people opportunities to see what players are out there and what styles click and what ones don't. So that, that's fantastic. But for me, like I always struggled with one shots, both uh, as a DM and as a player. Like I'm, I'm definitely the type of person who likes those long, super long arcs, and like my mind just thinks in that kind of uh, pacing and structure. So, like, what would you say is like the biggest thing that is different between a, you know, like a one shot game and a campaign? and how you so, would structure it. Yeah, so I mean, the, <laughs> what Chadzar says in the chat, the problem of one-shots is pacing. So pacing is the number one problem. Um, in where you're talking about these long, um, these long homebrew or these long campaigns, you can really stop when you feel necessary. When mm -hmm. you're doing a one-shot, you have to pace it to stop when you want it to stop at the end of the module. Otherwise, it's just this weird end that nobody gets to see. So how I build my one shots is mm -hmm. I have things that I can add and remove just to just to help with that pacing. Um, oh, OK. And I mean, it, it's really, really a delicate balance in the fact that so that's the, <laughs> I'm going to I don't want to say I'm going to pick on you a little bit. It's but listening to the one shot you're making. I'm concerned that there's too much in there, yeah, and it's going to take way too long. Concerns about that as well. So you know, I'm I'm constantly relooking at mine as I'm as I'm working on it actually to figure out how I'm going to trim some stuff out if I have to, or you know, 
whatever things I got to do. Yeah, I'm, I'm already I'm keeping that in mind as I go. So, so with that said, you know, when I do a one shot, I've I've working on my second one that I'm creating just from you know my own brain. I've mm-hmm. done one where it was an all Kenku cast, and it oh, was wow. actually set in the city of Waterdeep, uh, a kind of you know alongside our main Waterdeep campaign. Mm-hmm. So the the fun thing about that is the actions in the one shot have effects in the world that we're playing in. There you go. So, so you get a little continuity across the board, even though it was a one shot. That's that's sweet. I like that. Sure, and you can pull the lore from the one shot. You can pull mm-hmm. the lore from what the players did, and so it's like when you know they heard the news that a group of Kenku broke into this jail. They're like, I know what you're talking about. So it gives them <laughs> this little nostalgia, you know, uh, endorphin that pops off. But alongside that. It is pacing. Pacing is the number one thing you got to worry about when you are doing a one shot. Hands down. Now, I would imagine it's, I mean, it's already difficult to get players to do what you want them to do in the first place. Uh, but I would imagine combat is where time is made or lost for the most part. Because I think players, you know, doing role play, I think people are just generally, if they were doing role play, it's because they want to do role play. You know, and so they're going to be entertained if they're doing that. Uh, Whereas with combat, if you get the timing wrong on combat, too much, too little, that, that's a big problem. For people. Yeah, I, I think that's where being a good narrative combat DM can really help you out a lot. If you know how mm-hmm. to, with a few quick rolls, bypass a lot of that round-to-round combat that can bog you down. So, you know, I think, um, and I was, as I was telling Bob here before we started, like, all the mobs in my one shot are like challenge rating two or less, just because I don't want that many hit points on them. I want to, I want these guys to hit them, kill them, and move on. You know, like I don't want them standing there for half an hour slugging at a giant hit point, you know, machine. Like it's yeah. So like that's a good way of doing it, dealing with the kind of hit hit point sponging that occurs. Um, now, what kind of stories can you tell in a one shot? limitless really it's it's all about what you can come up with you know <laughs> yeah do you agree with that because i i feel like there are probably some stuff that you really can't do in a one shot that you can do in a long campaign and vice versa because i mean i think things that like just are funny or gimmicky i think have more legs in a one shot because you right. know if it doesn't go well it's done <laughs> you know <laughs> you can pull the ripcord and you're out <laughs> 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 so I agree. And uh, how I look at a one shot is a side quest. So mm-hmm. any we were talking about you know MMOs. If you're talking about like a, a side quest in WoW, um, mm-hmm. it's not really that important. It's just you kind of go and do something and you come back. So that's mm-hmm. kind of what a one shot you have the length for. Mm-hmm. Um, fun, funny you bring up the combat and the role play aspect of it. We did a we did a one shot that was a family dinner. So it was just a Christmas dinner where oh my god, it, it was a it was our Christmas special, but it was just a Christmas dinner where it was you know this broken family going back and forth and you know oh, just man. kind of picking on each other and we role played the entire time and you know my brother ran in he's like hey I got a fight for you guys do you want to do it <laughs> I don't know what's up to you <laughs> you're the DM you can do it you want we're having fun. Well, that's, that's the thing. Like, you know, some groups, I mean, they feel like they need it. You know, got to have that fight. And other groups are like, nah, just keep the fights out of the way. You know, I'm, I'm busy here. You know, I'm doing what I, we're, we're, we're ripping on each other at dinner. Come on. And that, 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 that helps when you know your players. What's really what's really the struggle for me creating this one shot for you guys on DadBot is I only know one of the four players, and I only kind of know that one guy a little bit. <laughs> like, I don't really know. I haven't played in a game literally with any of them yet, you know, so DM Chuck's the only guy who joined my one shot for years that I actually have had a conversation with. So it'll be interesting because I don't know how heavy role play these guys are versus how combat oriented they are. So that's why I say like, I don't know what they're going to do. It'll be great. And I imagine there's a little bit of flux that goes on, you know, even the same gaming group sometimes can be in a different mood. You know, like some games I go to the session, I'm like, boy, man, I want to fight something. I am just jonesing to get some X's and O's in. And other days, I'm like, God, if you put a fight in this scene, I'm going to be pissed. Like, just <laughs> come on, can we have a break? <laughs> you know? Like, yeah, so, 100%. The old one-shots, man. And a lot, of, a lot of time in a campaign, that depends on what you've been doing lately. 
So maybe yeah. what you've been doing in other games, like, you know, we talked a little last week, I think, with Lindy about character bleed. So sometimes if mm-hmm. you're experiencing a lot of roleplay bleed, like, you might be ready for combat. Or if you've just been in dungeons, then you're ready for roleplay. Like, that can maybe have a bit of a difference in a one-shot if you're sliding one in there somewhere, but... Mm-hmm. Otherwise, I, I think most people are usually down for whatever. Yeah, definitely. So, okay, we have the terms of, like, pacing in mind here. Uh, are there any particular game systems you find that are more conducive to one-shots? Um, yeah, absolutely. So we've done we've done a few one-shots in Monster of the Week, and mm-hmm. um, I'm not sure how familiar you are with it, but Monster of the Week Just is... Much. <laughs> okay, so yeah, it, it it is simply, you know, you take back to these, um, you know, like Buffy the Vampire Slayer, you mm-hmm. charmed all of these things where it was one episode was Monster of the Week, and mm-hmm. it, it is perfect in that scenario because you have a very set end and a good stopping point mm-hmm. where you could keep this campaign going. So there's a um, pretty popular group of people who play the, uh, the Adventure Zone. So mm-hmm. they play Dungeons & Dragons 5e when it was their original group. Then they moved on to Monster of the Week, and so they're playing this weekly campaign, but they're playing a little bit differently than you know the campaign is set up for. It's set up for you go and fight this monster, mm-hmm. then you go and fight this monster, and then you just keep progressing down this line um, you know, clearly there's role play that you can add in there as well. Mm-hmm. But it, it is a perfect one shot system if that's what you're looking for. But so is D&D. D&D is a perfect one shot system in the fact that I, I can make whatever story I want and mm-hmm. I just have to figure out how to pace it properly. Yeah, absolutely. Well, like you said about Christmas dinner, like that's an entire one shot that if you're playing for just an hour or two, you could you could never make a roll. Like, that whole thing could just be pure roleplay. Like, you almost don't even need a system if you're going that heavy into the roleplay. Like, because oh, yeah. your sheet's going to sit there and maybe never get used, other than creating the sheet maybe helped you figure out who your character is a little bit. But other than that, you're you're just pure roleplaying in that one. You know, so, I mean, yeah, I mean, I think that one-shots give you a good opportunity to kind of try other systems, too. So, like, if you come across one before you start writing out a a three-year campaign, you know, sit down, do a one-shot, and just see if everyone likes the system, and then you can do something bigger, more involved later. Absolutely. And it looks like Jay Brews in the chat is saying that uh, Shadowrun makes for a really good one-shot game. I, I, that definitely makes sense to me, you know, in the it, it, the bite size quality of a Shadowrun itself, you know, like an actual go out there, do a mission, call it a day. I'm trying to read some of this other chat we got going on here. Yeah, RP is pretty much system independent, I would say. Um, I think that there's a lot of um, there are some things in systems that give you give you more legs of your table to set your RP on. Like like we were talking about before that a little bit. Like sometimes it kind of felt like a table that was missing a leg. Like <laughs> you could try to R- you could RP outside of it, but then like at some point you kind of had to go back to what it does, right? Like and so I think like games like World of Darkness though, however, like that's a great system for RP. You know, there's a lot of those systems out there that are really good for it. So I think those are, you could, but the, I find World of Darkness would be harder to run a one shot in, in my opinion. Hunter? uh, Hunter, maybe. When you're playing the humans, when you're the weaker ones, it makes perfect sense. I think with like Vampire, like those, it's really hard to do a one shot because they're so long term thinking. So, I mean, those are harder to do, in my opinion. But, because that's the thing about a one shot, like, there's no tomorrow. You're not worried about builds and leveling and character progression you're just there in that moment you're you're role playing and you know in the kind of as hard as you can i guess for whatever you're doing for that one game you know well i guess speaking on that like what do you do to keep players within like a expected style of play because i mean in a one shot you have no repercussions for what you do you know do you let people just go balls out crazy like we were saying in the chat here earlier you know killing everything until the town's guards show up or do you feel like uh, you need something a little different out of your one-shots? For me, I do a mini Session Zero off-stream mm-hmm. before anything happens, and it's just, hey, this is what it is. You will be railroaded a little bit because it's a one-shot. We have a certain amount to get to. And I, I will try to give you the agency that you want as a player, 
Mm-hmm. But let me be clear, we, we have something we, you know, we have this objective we're trying to get to. And I just ask, just try and go along with it. Um, you know, sure, you could you could do one where, hey, players, do whatever the heck you want. I'm here just to facilitate this game. Just do whatever you want. But mm-hmm. in, in these traditional one shots, you don't really have that opportunity. And so that's that's where it differs from like this long campaign. In you know, <laughs> in in our water deep, there are we probably go three three hour sessions with no combat. Because nice. they want to just sit there and play. They want to role play. So I'm, you know, as the DM, they'll, they'll IM me on the side and say, hey, we want combat. Okay, cool. I'll do that. Mm-hmm. But I want you guys to have the agency to do what you're doing. And, you know, if you guys want to play DIY troll scroll manner, fine, go ahead. I'm here mm-hmm. to help you. <laughs> so. I think, I think for like what you're doing on your channel, because you're offering so many one shots and they're all so different from each other, the players who want specific things are going to gravitate towards I think the games that they think at least are going to be what they want. So I think other than our your pre-assigned like ahead of time meeting between DM and players to really talk about it and start to hash out like what this game's going to be, how long it'll take, you know, to get those expectations out there that very minimal social contract if you will like we talk about every episode on this the show, you know, um to get those things out of the way is a is a good place I suppose to to really make sure that everyone's going to have a good time when the actual one shot gets started versus like a pickup game of basketball. If you're having one of those, like your gaming shop or something where you just grab five guys, like, oh, let's try this thing out. Like who knows what you're going to get. So, right. <laughs> now, do you start off by giving characters to the players? Like do you have pre-gen guys or do you let people make their own characters? So I let them make their own characters because it gives them a sense of this is mine. This is who I am. Mm-hmm. Now for Kenku, you know, they only have a set, they don't have like their own language. They only have a set remembering of, you know, they can mimic the lines that are said to them. So I did give them five lines that everybody got, and then they could pick two. So they had a s- seven total lines that they could say throughout the campaign. So good. The module. And then, um, you know, as, as the NPCs would talk to them or guards would say stuff, they could pick those up and, and mm-hmm. add to their, you know, their vocabulary a little bit, but which uh, is pretty interesting. You know, if you try to take like predator style, just like clips of things and respond with it, like it doesn't always work out the way you want it to. But that's all you got. <laughs> yeah, and I can see that being awesome. It, it was. It was. So it was with my normal crew. I think it was Chris, um, Devin, Brittany. So they're all part of the main crew of Dadbod, and then it was with you know some rando from our chat. Mm-hmm. Um, but that is something that is going to test somebody's roleplay ability in the fact that you can't just do anything you want anymore. You have this set, mm-hmm. you know, shackle that you got to play around. Um, so it, you know, it, it helps make us all just better. I would players. definitely agree with that. That's like, it's like weight training, you know, for sports. You know, you give a, yourself a specific handicap, something interesting, some dynamic at play in your character that maybe isn't something you're good at initially. And you go into the game and you just try to figure it out. Like, I love that stuff. Yeah. And it does give people a chance to just try other things, too. So, you know, not speaking Kenku, if, if you, you know, say you've played a paladin for three years and mm-hmm. you want to play something else, hey, you have the shot. You have the opportunity just to mess around. Try try something else. Try a new build. Try try to min-max a character. This is, this is the, the place where you can do that without a break in the game. <laughs> <laughs> So our chat's talking a little bit here, and actually by a little bit I mean a lot. Um, but Shadzar is saying that uh, uh, with pickups in particular, they're talking about um, interviewing people ahead of time to figure out if they're going to be a good fit and how, if I'm reading this correctly, that they're saying that you can't really get that information until they're actually on the stream with you in the table in a real situation. You know, because people tend to be a little different uh, at the table and then not just at the table, but in particular on a stream. Yeah, and that's that's kind of the thing like I was saying earlier. Like I don't I don't completely disagree with him. Like I think it's different than walking onto a court not knowing mm-hmm. who the other five people are at all like at all that are playing and decide that now there's six of you are gonna play some three on three, divvy up real quickly into two teams and just start playing basketball. But the difference is everybody knows what basketball is. 
there's not a lot of house rules in basketball. Sometimes there's a few, but there's usually not a lot of house rules. You usually know what you're getting into. With a one-shot D&D type game or tabletop role-playing game, you don't know what the heck you're really getting into. Like, it can, be, it can go a lot of different ways. So I think it's a little different. Like, I think you have to go through those introductory interviews. Like, I think, like, you know, for Bob, like, when he's looking at these one-shots, like, I think he's taking a little time to figure out who it is he wants to actually try to run these games. He's not just randomly picking up and saying, hey, run a one-shot. Like, he's, I think he's going through the list and kind of credentialing people a little bit before he makes his decisions, you know. You're not just picking up anybody at that point. <laughs> Absolutely. And so player versus DM, those are, those are two very, very, very different things. Uh, mm -hmm. A DM is somebody who, you know, I would trust to represent a brand that we're trying to make, right? So I wouldn't just allow some Joe Schmo off the street to come in and DM a game on our stream because it is a representation of who we are. But just like you said, you're going to be doing one. I trust you. I see what you do. I, you know, I interact with you every single day, and I know that's your that you first are... mistake. <laughs> <laughs> it's like you know, he's uh, never actually seen me DM a game before. <laughs> <laughs> well, but that's why I asked. So, but it, you know, it, it's your pillar in the community, as much as you want to say it. Um, in the fact that I, I give that trust, even though mm -hmm. yes, I have not seen him DM a game. You know, I kind of know who he is and who his personality is. Now, for a player, we have controls in place that will, you know, just like Chad, Chad's are saying, once the stream is on, they could be complete, you know, dot, dot, dot. I have a control in place that if you're going to act like uh, a jerk or you're going to mm -hmm. be discriminatory, you're going you're gonna to be hateful, whatever it is, I'm going to cut you right there and just apologize to everybody watching and say, hey, you've made some changes. We're going to continue on. And you won't be allowed to do it again because that's not what we represent. That's not who we are. Mm -hmm. We want somebody that is a safe place for everybody. Right. Yeah. You know, you've got to have pretty stringent controls on that as with the players in particular. Because, yeah, they are some true wild cards. And live action, that's where things go off the rails and you have to deal with it in the moment. Unlike a lot of times at a table where, you know, there's a conversation you have later. You know, when you have an audience, you know, you really have to pull the trigger quick on saying like, well, actually, I, th I guess it, the, the old adage for hiring and firing works here. So, you know, like hire slow, fire fast, you know. Oh, absolutely. And I think it's the same thing with these players, you know, like take your time, get to know who they are, make sure they're on the same page. And then if things go wrong, do like you were saying, just cut their mic, cut their stream, get them out of here. <laughs> yeah, and it's unfortunate because I don't want somebody to be offended. But mm -hmm. I don't want somebody to be cut. Yeah. Because maybe they don't know better, but you still, you still, there's, there's a level of, you know, intelligence that, that yeah. it should be, well, I don't even want to say intelligence, it's common sense. Mm -hmm. Don't be a jerk and you'll be fine. You know? Yeah. And the only people that have a hard time with that are jerks. So it's, <laughs> it, it works, you know, like if you can't figure out the difference between pro social behavior and being a jerk, I don't want you on my my stream, <laughs> you know. Exactly. exactly. So, I'm getting a bit of wife anger. I'll be right back in just a second. She's looking for a package. All right. So important packages. You got to take care of the family life. I understand it happens. Yeah. So yeah, um, you know sometimes things like this happen live. You know, like what we're talking about right now, and one of our people has to go do something. You know, these things like, oh, I'll take over. Yeah. I'm just gonna kick him right off. You can take his <laughs> place permanently on the wisdom check. We will no longer have Dustin around. Perfect upgrade. <laughs> you can't even hear any of this, so he's going to listen back. And be like, what the heck? <laughs> oh, man. So, okay, you're, you've done, like, how many one-shots have you run, do you think? I have ran three. Mm -hmm. I have been a part of ten. Um I mean, we we do them, we do them quite a bit, and you know, we we've done a monster of the week one. We've done where we're all goblins. We've done where we're all Kenku. Um, we've done the family dinner. Mm -hmm. uh, we did a Halloween one, which was great. We kind of fought against some of the well-known slasher mm -hmm. you know, enemies, so Chucky and Jason and stuff like that. Nice. Um, but yeah, I mean. One, one shots are a different animal than any campaign I've ever played in. Mm -hmm. 
Now, what would you say is your your favorite moment from a one shot? That's tough. Um, <laughs> I mean, it's tough because I, I think one of my favorite moments of a one shot was a Christmas dinner where we're all just joking around and having fun. Sounds you know? so good. <laughs> um, you know, the DM had probably four different characters that he was in and out of. Um, you know, Kylie, who was on your guys' wisdom check, mm-hmm. uh, she was that old aunt from like. Brooklyn or whatever that <laughs> is super judgy. Uh, Devin and I were brothers that, you know, I was the, he was kind of the brother that isn't, uh, the black, he's the black sheep of the family and I'm the, uh, you know, the golden child. So it was always, it was, it was this fun interaction that we had that it Beautiful made for a ton of laughs. Yeah. So basically it's just a big improv sesh. Now, one of the things, uh, said in the chat here just a second ago, it's, it's interesting. Um, Sheds are saying that they've seen, uh, a streamer actually going to another streamer's channel to intentionally tank that stream. Have you come across why? that before? I couldn't imagine why, but I, uh, competitors, I guess. I mean, as much. I mean, who who's actually competing? Honestly, like we're all here to like help each other out. I would think, but I guess there are some bad actors out there. I, I couldn't imagine why, but hmm. I mean, for for me. You know, I, I think the tabletop community as a whole is super mm-hmm. supportive of everybody. I have not seen it. I mm-hmm. mean, we're not big enough to, like, if I take tabletop to keyboard down, you know, I gain 10 followers or 150 followers. What, like, that to me doesn't matter. I'm, I, you know, I want to help support you in hopes mm-hmm. that you're going to help support me because mm-hmm. that's how we grow. We, we grow our communities, we grow together, and we help each other. Um, if, if it happens, like I said, I have a control in place that will just cut it and we'll move on. Now, what happens in the case that you have a DM who, uh, ends up being the problem? Cause I mean, with a player, you can just chop one player off and keep going. I, I think, like you said, I'm very, very picky of who's going to DM on the, on the actual channel. Mm-hmm. So if you want to, if you want to set up a game and I don't know you, Mm-hmm. Um, it won't be streamed. It'll be just, you can set it up however you want and just do it and you use Discord and I'll, I'll help facilitate it, but it won't mm-hmm. be streamed because I don't know you. We'll right. always record it and then premiere it later if you were going to put it on your stream. That'd be another way to do it is you can record ahead of time and premiere later. It wouldn't be live for people to interact with or watch like exactly the same. Like it wouldn't quite be the same, but you could still do it that way if you had concerns, I suppose, about someone. Agreed, right. yeah. I think that could be an interesting system in general if you're growing a community, you know, just to say, okay, your first one shot that you run or your first game that you're going to do, you do it off stream. It's your audition tape, essentially. See how you deal with certain players that, and maybe like populate it with players, you know, so you have a sense of how they play and what sorts of things they may throw at a DM. And then you can kind of get some feedback on it and then kind of grow your, your stable of potential DMs that way. Yeah, I agree. And, you know, one of of the things, too, about this community is Mm -hmm. it may happen one time, Mm -hmm. but we are so good together that we root those people out very quickly. And, you know, the people who ask, well, how can tolerant people be intolerant of intolerance? Because it's just that. Like, it's not okay (laughs) to be intolerant of other things. And so we as a community very quickly drive those people out. I see it every single day on Twitter in the fact that, you know, it, it is Pride Month and people who want to come in and bash that kind of stuff, mm-hmm. they get they get flamed so quickly. And it's a good thing to see because we help mm-hmm. rally around the other people to pick them up. Absolutely. You know, that's, that's the biggest thing. Like, you know, if we want to actually make this, you know, pastime that we all enjoy, this hobby, something that more people can share, more people enjoy, and that actually it becomes more popular. So, you know, maybe in turn, we turn out to be a little more popular. Huh? You know, you got to be out there supporting each other, lifting each other up. And, you know, I, I think everybody, at least that I'm seeing in our Discord and our uh, you know, shows and everything, they've really been stepping it up and just showing the love for people, going to everybody's chats, checking out their streams, checking out their games. And, you know, I, I feel really good about this whole thing. And I love seeing what you're doing, and I, it's just—it's really synergizing really well. I would say, you know, Great. like—is there anything we could be doing more? You think to uh, kind of facilitate that? Um, I mean, uh, there, there's always things that people could do. You know, I 
the, the what you guys do already is amazing, and I wouldn't ever ask for any more. Um, you, you guys, you know, like I said, I, I love everything that you guys have done. You know, I finally had the chance to catch the Everstorm, and the intro you guys did was awesome. Oh, man. Clint, yeah, knocked man. Out Clint the- knocked that thing out of the park. Yeah, it was amazing. <laughs> Like, it blew our minds when we saw it the first time, too. Like, luckily, we get to see it ahead of time, so we weren't, like, you know, Levi, the DM, was the only one who didn't get to see it ahead of time, so. Yeah, yeah his reaction was great. When, once you went to the actual cams of everybody, I was just like, man, that's priceless. <laughs> um, but, I mean, everything that we do together, hopefully we can just help promote each other and go forward. Um, in, in the fact that we're all part of the same community, so we all should be able to help support each other. And, you know, what you guys have done already is amazing. That's all I, all I can say. And with our, like, I think something that we're talking about here, like, I think Discord helps a lot with that vetting process. Mm-hmm. Because if we get you guys into the Discords, I'm in your Discord, you're in ours, we see what each other's doing all the time. Uh, but when we're bringing other people into our Discord, some of them we're bringing in kind of blind. You know, I'll put just blind invites out there and let people from Twitter come in. But once you're in there <laughs> and you start talking... Very, almost nobody takes the blind invites. I've almost stopped doing it because nobody ever takes it. But um, but even if they people who come in there, they're going to start chatting and com- conversing. You're going to see a little who they are before you invite them to a game or you invite them to anything else. You're going to get some time to talk with them in a format where they can only do so much damage. They're not on your stream. They're not you know affecting you in right. that way. And it's a it's a place where you can delete anything that was put in you can take it back you can moderate right. it like you got a lot more control there so i think discord's a great vetting tool in the community to help if you're going to bring people into your streams or do fine games and things like that to an extent and, and uh jeff mm-hmm. i think you said it earlier today in the fact that once you go live people get that deer in the headlights look once you're streaming, they may be amazing in Discord where they're typing and they don't really have to have that social interaction. Mm-hmm. But once you go live and people are like, what? Oh my god. So and then you, you can hear it in their voice. They're just nervous. Mm-hmm. It, it becomes this nightmare for them and a nightmare for you as a streamer because you're like, <laughs> um, you're really on my stream right now, Kevin. Kind of <laughs> Get the hook. <laughs> In the case of Wisdom Check, that's why we do the 30 minutes before start chit-chat with it. We try to get people in here early so we can get them, get them talking and get that initial out of the way, you know, before the, before the intro runs, you know. Hopefully it works. I, I feel like we've had some pretty good track records with that so far. Been rocking it out. Great guest. Been loving it. You know, uh, out. So- we, did, we didn't even have to say his name. He's calling himself out. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, okay, with, with this Discord and community building we're talking about, we're kind of like drifting topics a little bit, but uh, one of the things I was considering earlier was um, at what point do you start putting together community guidelines? You know, like, should you have rules up front ahead of time, or should you wait till events start to occur to react to them? Like, I personally am a preemptive kind of person, but oh, yeah. uh, some oh, people yeah. aren't. So me as a person, I like to set expectations, and that mm-hmm. way I can hold you accountable for you breaking expectations. So whenever we have somebody join our Discord, we take them to the welcome landing page, and then mm-hmm. they see our rules, and if you're not going to follow the rules, you'll be, you'll be warned, and then you'll be kicked very quickly. Um, and the same, same goes for the one shots that we set up, in the fact that I have a checklist, which I doesn't need to give it to you. <laughs> Um, I have a checklist of what you're expected to do for the channel before, like a week before. So a week before, this is what you should be doing. You should have your character made or started to be made. You know, I, I, in the 10 one shots that I've ran or I've been a part of, people are making their character the night of and they're like, oh wait, what does this do? And it's like five minutes before the stream, and you're like, oh my goodness. We're, we're one-fourth of the way there. Chuck already gave me his character. I already put it into roll 20. It's done. So I got one out of four, man. I'm good to go right now. <laughs> one out of four, at um, least. But so I, I have that checklist, and it is very crucial that you try and help. Like, there's going to be times where people get busy, and they do it five minutes before, and that's okay. Mm-hmm. But, you know, if you give people as much heads up, it weakens the impact of oh, no, I'm yeah. five minutes before, and I don't have the character. Yeah. So yeah have you, a... uh... Oh, go ahead. 
I want those characters early because it helps me it helps me really adjust the content I'm currently creating for this one shot. Just knowing who the characters are and what their capabilities are, I can now better customize the game a little bit to the character the player characters a little so that I can make sure they can navigate this thing a little better. Like what are they gonna be good at, what are they not gonna be good at, what skills do they have and don't have. Like I can really make a better experience if I have those PCs a week or two ahead of time even. So I'm already asking my guys for sheets. I'm like, give me your sheets. Like, come on, let me know what you're playing. <laughs> no, and I don't want to like tell you how to run your stuff, but a suggestion that may be interesting, if, if it's some thought, is uh, have you thought about like how Uber does their system where the DMs maybe and the players can rate each other after their experience and then keep track of that somewhere? I really like that idea and I'm totally going to take it. Take it up. <laughs> <laughs> Now your job is to get back hold of Jeff later and make him put together the damn system so you don't have to do any work, Bob. It's his idea. Make him do it. (laughs) Give me work. (laughs) Um, No, I mean, that's a great idea. And so even, even with that, we, the, one of our very first guests that we had, she made it onto the dad bod crew as a full-time player now. Mm -hmm. And, you know, she did so well in her one shot of never playing with any of these people before. And she came in and nailed it, and you know, so it, it is a it is nice to have a mental rating system, but to actually kind of put it down and be like. But that also goes into what I was trying to say. If we are trying to set this community up as mm-hmm. a place to look for a group, mm-hmm. you could rate somebody on your likes and dislikes. So if you're a player that likes more combat, you're probably mm-hmm. going to want to be paired with a group of people that like more combat. If sure. you're a player that likes more RP you're going to want to be paired with people that like more RP. And that way, if you do rate them, I mean, I'm, my mind's going a million miles a minute now because of what you just said. <laughs> um, but that rating system would be crucial in the fact mm-hmm. that if you get a one star, you're going to be at the bottom of my priorities. Yeah, yeah. And then maybe you can use, like, a ranking system on Discord. So, like, if you're a one star average, you're one star rank. If you're two star average, you know, you just set the ranks up. And then maybe give it, like, priorities. So, like, if you have so many slots at your table and multiple people sign up for it, you know, more people than their slots, you take the highest ratings. I feel pressure to perform. Yeah, you better now. Making... This is what I, I do, by the way. I am, Thanks, I am Jeff. That's, I needed that in my life. <laughs> I make things more complicated for everybody. Um, so the chat's asking, abilities. why don't you like to do pre-gen characters for one-shots? bring it up you know there's a lot of advantages just this is a this is a good time i'll bring this up um our friend jowsum is running the new aliens game aliens Mm -hmm. rpg came out it has what effectively is kind of a one shot that you can run he got like some kind of pre-order like one shot now they ran it over two sessions but nonetheless it's it's basically just one adventure but um it comes with pre-gen characters so you don't make your character when you run that one shot you have the crew already created so, you know, there's a captain, there's a medic, there's, like, all those roles are filled, and you take over those characters, and then you play them, like, how you want with some kind of specific things. So, I don't think there's anything wrong with doing pre-gen characters, as long as everybody's up for that. But in my opinion, if it's a one-shot, and I want roleplay, I want people to pick something they're going to have fun with, and I want them to be able to maybe even do things that they normally can't do in a normal game. Like, something that would never be allowed anywhere else, play it in my one-shot. You know, that's 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 a good place for it, so... Well, I mean, my answer is it gives the character agency of their player. It gives it gives somebody agency of what they want to do, and everybody I interact with on Twitter mm-hmm. loves making characters. It yeah, doesn't matter if they're ever going to play them; they just like to make the character and see what it is. And so it gives them that ability to just make a character that maybe, or maybe use a character they've made that they've always wanted to play, and then they just have to kind of adjust the ratio for you know the stat level of it. Um, and it, it gives them that ability to do it. And it, it just gives people a good sense in the fact that, well, I don't really want to play that character because everybody else was already taken, so I get the short end of the straw. I mean, that mm-hmm. would make the experience a little bit less fun for me as a person. Yeah, yeah. Now, do you find uh, certain level ranges in, like, say, D&D are better or less suited for one-shots or that you prefer, I guess? Uh, less suited for one shots are probably one to the th- one to three because mm-hmm. that area you really can't do much, um, mm-hmm. and it doesn't really matter what class you pick. 
to an extent. I mean, you don't have a lot of the fun stuff that comes with these classes. Mm -hmm. I think I think the sweet spot is five to ten. Perfect, and that's where um, you get cool abilities, and you can you can have hard fights that are maybe you don't always have in your campaigns. Mm -hmm. um, I did do a one shot where we were all level twenty, and that was kind of that was crazy. We fought a Tarask, and it was I mean it was it was nuts. Yeah, it was that was like three hours of combat, and it was like kind of boring by the end. Yeah, unfortunately, that's the nature of the Tarask. <laughs> <laughs> well, right, but interesting. <laughs> it, it's something I would never do in a, a campaign. I've never mm -hmm. ever in the five years I've played D anD D had a campaign go over level. Yeah, I think in a campaign that you get up to that level, you have time to kind of like grow into the character and understand it. With one shot, man, holy crap. Like, if you handed me a level 20 character, and I'm a stat junkie character sheet guy, if you handed me a level 20 character, I'd be like, what am I, what? <laughs> I don't know how to do this thing. <laughs> you know? And I imagine a lot of people around the table will be having the same I, experience. I think for me, like, I always come up with character ideas in my head, and some of them are very gimmicky. Like, mm -hmm. they're not anything I can really see myself playing for, like, 20 levels. Not that our campaigns typically ever get there. I think the last uh, Limb World campaign, we hit, like, 18. Like, we got close. And we did fight a Trask at the end of it, oddly enough. Yeah, we did. But uh, first time in 30 years Levi's ever used a Trask, the only time he ever used it was in that campaign. So it was 30 years coming. Um, but somehow nonetheless, it was... Two Trask, yeah, so somehow you fought two. But, um... Interestingly enough, though, like, I get a lot of these character ideas that are very gimmicky. And so I'm like, mm -hmm. this is not campaign material. But if I get a chance to play in a shorter game, a one shot or a shorter game, like this thing could be hell of fun for one time. And so I've got a few of those yeah. that I guess always are in my head. So if I get these opportunities, I definitely will will utilize some of them. Now, uh, you know, our gaming group is mostly homebrew, and if by mostly I mean almost exclusively homebrew. Um, and it sounds like your your groups are doing homebrew material here. Uh, how often do you come across pre-generated content? in a one-shot format? Um, not too frequently, but that is kind of an avenue we want to go down. Um, mm -hmm. it, would be, it would be fun to play a one-shot and then rate it, because I know DM's Guild has a plethora of different one-shots. Um, mm -hmm. But it would be nice to work with some of these content creators, work with some of the, you know, uh, module creators and figure mm -hmm. out how to get maybe ahead of it and, and maybe work with them to a pre-release and yeah. you know but but these are the things that, that I want to help promote. I want to help people understand yes, I can come up with one shots all day long but I want people to understand that there are people who put a lot of time and effort into creating these mm -hmm. and it helps advertise them as well. So I mean, I see them, I haven't we're going to run, um, it's the Lost Library of Qualish. It's a published one-shot that has been modified. It's a published Pathfinder one-shot mm -hmm. that's being modified for D&D &D 5e by Devin, who's in our group. Um, but it, it it is a published one-shot, and so it, it is interesting to see how those are laid out and written versus what I do out of my own head. You know, another thing that might be kind of interesting, uh, we're, we're given kind of a, a unique opportunity with streaming content, right? In that it's recorded, and we can go back and rewatch it and take notes on what's happened. And that's already been an advantage in just our tabletop experience we've been having. But in these cases of one-shots, it, it almost seems like it would be a good idea to go back and archive what the actual session was yeah. and maybe have material that could be reused, you know, in future one-shots, you know, with different tables. I think so. I think it'd be great. And then, you know, if you have a published one shot that other people want to run. So amazingly enough, I have so many people that hit up, hit us up on Twitter, hit us up on the YouTube comments, or even in our uh, discord that say, Hey, I've been following your tomb of annihilation run. Mm -hmm. and you've really given me advice. That's part of what we want to do too. In the fact that we're out here kind of running these things to help other people figure out how to run them too. Um, and that's kind of where the one shot department that we're creating is going. I want to help people understand, is this a good module? What, what are your challenges with it? What as a DM mm -hmm. should you know to prepare? Um, how much prep time is there? Because that's a huge one too. In the fact that 
we're all super busy. It's summer. We have lives outside of tabletop games. Um, prep time is so big as a DM, and that's, you know, the, the age-old meme of everything is when you're looking for a group, mm -hmm. it'll take hundreds of years if, if you need a DM, but if you're a DM <laughs> yeah. looking for a group, it's, you know, seconds. Yep, yep, absolutely um, true. Yeah, literally seconds sometimes. Like, <laughs> I felt like you posted my one shot, and it was full in, like, 2.2 <laughs> seconds. I was like, okay, and I've got four players. Excellent, all right. And like, um, I mean, it's the same thing in MMOs, you know, when, when you're a tank or a healer, you're going to get oh, it right yeah. away. When you're a DPS, so, it's 20 to an hour. Those queues are super short when you're a tank or healer. Yeah. It's, <laughs> you got yeah. that right. Uh, yeah, I think this may be something we should add to our Discord is a section where people can share uh, content they're creating. So like modules that they're writing or um, maybe homebrew character classes or something. Because I think this creativity uh, that we have in our community is just massive. I have um, contemplated the idea of creating, like, you know how we have uh, guest stars as, like, a mm -hmm. special denotation in our Discord, but having a separate color set up for content creators. I thought mm -hmm. it would be really cool to help distinguish them. And artists, too. I want to do the same for artists down the road. We get more artists yeah. in. We can do a lot of things. Like, because we're doing a lot of things with our channel, uh, but there are always more things we could be doing. And, you know, as we're kind of getting our, our legs and kind of understanding what it is that we're doing, you know, kind of feeling out the, the boundaries of some of these things, um, you know, I feel like we're going to get better. about you, zombie? I see you in the chat. I, you didn't get a notice there. <laughs> oh, man. Well, um, I feel like I want to make that announcement now. Do you, do you think it's a good timing? We, we've delayed it long enough. Apparently Dustin's mic is not picking up his words, but I think he mouth yes. <laughs> He's like, yes, I want you to do that right now. <laughs> you got me? So, yeah, go ahead. I'm going to let you have. So for the chat that may not have been here at the start, I teased that we had a big announcement that I was hoping not to jinx myself on. And that's that uh, we're branching out a little bit on our guest list. And we've had some phenomenal guests, including the one we're talking to right now. Uh, people in our group and building a community at our local level. Um, but through some miracle of networking and uh, just having friends in the right places, we've got Satine Phoenix coming on our show August 12th. And if you don't know who she is, Satine Phoenix was previously a community manager for Wizards of the Coast, Dungeons and Dragons arm, between 2018 and 2019. And she's on a lot of the big stuff. She, she's been doing a lot of these shows uh, that are connected to the Matt Mercer fan clubs and all that kind of stuff. So, yeah, I cannot believe that this has happened, but um, I've got confirmation emails from her assistant saying that's going to occur. And uh, unless the floor falls out from underneath this, that's a thing. That's and so we've awesome. got some others in the works potentially, too. I'm not going to put the names out, but um, if not they the, come uh, through... That's not the only one we've got lined up that might be a big deal. So we're... Got a couple huge names, uh, and you could say, and you could say, Bob, you were here first. Yes, <laughs> nailed it. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yeah, I'm super pumped about this. I think it's uh, it's an opportunity for us to really kind of push our community as a whole up, because uh, if we get noticed, you know, through that, we're going to get a lot more people coming in here, and we're going to be pointing them to some of the other channels that we're associated with. And, uh, you know, it's going to be an opportunity to make a big splash. So uh, we're, we're thinking about how we want to handle that when it comes down the pipe. And, you know, depending on how many people are really excited about interacting and uh, asking questions and things, we may have to come up with a system to deal with that. Uh, but, uh, yeah, super excited. Dude, this is going to be awesome. <laughs> gonna be. I'm, I will say part of me is jealous because <laughs> I, when I'm learning how to DM, she took mm -hmm. over the Geek and Sundry DM Dungeon mm -hmm. Masters corner, and she does a great job of it. Um, oh yeah, I mean, she, I mean, it, you have big shoes to fill, and it was Matt Mercer, but yeah, uh, I mean, she did it, and it was great. I love everything she's put out. Yeah, she's putting out great content, and you know, sure. it's it's freaking amazing uh, that you know she's kind of bringing a different style to to gaming. You know, it's it's allowing kind of. Uh, the rock star attitude, I guess, into, into gaming. And it's just freaking cool. 
And uh, like I said, she's connected to a lot of interesting people out there doing some really amazing things. Uh, so I don't know. I, I'm trying not to get too pumped in case it doesn't happen for sure. I, I'm I'm like 99% sure it's going to happen, but the pessimist in me is freaking right. out a little bit. Right now, the TT2KB <laughs> model is is just stay calm and keep streaming. That's what we're doing for right now, you know, mm-hmm. is stay calm, keep streaming, you know. Fake it till you make it, and then you're there and you made it. You got it. <laughs> Absolutely. Woo! So that's out of the bag. bag. <laughs> uh, now that now that now that we finally let Jeff get his announcement out that we've been wanting to say for a while now, <laughs> we can we can move on into uh, the second half of our show tonight here with uh, Bob from Dadbod D and D, uh, and we wanted to talk a little bit about your Waterdeep game. Um, the reason why I bring this up is because um, you guys are running a module right now for your game. You're doing Dragon Heist. And I've seen Dragon Heist done on a few other channels. Uh, but what makes your guys' game special, in my opinion, and we talked about this a little bit before we went live, was just how comfortable your group is literally just sitting in the middle of a module and deciding they're just going to roleplay for a whole session. Like, there's no urgency necessarily to like push towards what's the next plot hook in this thing where's the next map where are we going to next like they're real comfortable sitting there just having a conversation with themselves in their quote-unquote house thing they have you know because for those of you i don't want to spoil water to eat dragon heist too much but early on you get property and that's why we're going to talk about player-owned assets here in a little bit too because i and how that can help you with this but so how do you as a DM running this module, like, are there things you do to kind of help with that, or is that just naturally them, or do you feel like the urge to push them a little, or do you just, like, no, just, this is great, just let it go? And if you're ready to hear the conclusion of our talk and all the answers that the one wonderful DM Bob has to tell us, you're going to have to tune in for our next episode, which will be out very shortly, so take a look for that. And I want to say thank you very much for coming today and enjoying our announcements and everything else and putting up with the awful hissing noise on our background here. We really appreciate it. If you would like to donate some cash to make sure that Dustin gets a better microphone, please do, because holy crap, that thing sucks. Uh, But all jokes aside, please leave a like if you enjoyed this, subscribe if you haven't already, Give us some ideas of topics you want us to talk about down in the comments below. And we'll see you next time, live, on Mondays at 10 p.m. Ta-ta.